Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. I want to welcome you all to our Independent Policy Forum program this evening. Um, as many of you know, we hold events like this on a monthly basis approximately, featuring many top scholars and policy experts and authors of important new books, and tonight is no exception. Our program today is entitled, Why Freedom Matters More Than Ever, and our speaker today is the economist and author David Henderson, who is author of a very important new book, which I hope that everyone will be getting, called The Joy of Freedom, An Economist's Odyssey. As many of you know, the Independent Institute is a nonprofit public policy research organization. We sponsor studies by different scholars that result in books, and we publish a journal called The Independent Review, edited by Robert Higgs, and we end up covering a huge number of major issues. Our forum this evening is intended to engage audiences in many of these issues. Um, we're particularly grateful that uh, Robert Mondavi is kind enough to donate the wine for uh, these programs. And I also want to uh, encourage all of you who are interested in public policy issues to visit our website at independent.org. Uh, I want to particularly uh, welcome our uh, viewers from C-SPAN today. And uh, on our website, you can find information not only about our publication and events and media programs and so much more, but also information on our homepage specifically about many of the issues involved in the current war on terrorism. In the aftermath of September 11th, uh, virtually everyone has recognized that the specific individuals responsible for the mass murders have to be brought to justice. And in doing so, everyone is seeking not only justice but security, but not as an end in itself. We seek security to enjoy the blessings of liberty, the American legacy of liberty. And we believe that we must achieve security in a matter consistent with a diverse and open society, individual liberty, and the rule of law. However, continuing to deny the obvious fact that the horrific events of 9-11 are related to US policy in the Mideast is, I think, a, a misgotten sense of what is happening. In the last few months since 9-11, we've seen an interesting series of events. We've seen a stampede of lobbyists using the cover of terrorism to extract corporate welfare for the airlines, for the insurance industry, for agriculture, and a host of other special interests. A new Office of Homeland Security has been established. Now, I thought that the Department of Defense was supposed to be protecting the homeland. <laughs> now, if they're not, the question is, what is the Department of Defense doing? In addition, we've recently seen the passage of what some would consider to be a rather Orwellian uh, USA Patriot Act, which has given police and intelligence agencies the opportunity to do searches and intercept information from all Americans. The Presidential Records Act has been overridden by President Bush. The President has signed into power a new series of secret military tribunals to, to try non-US citizens. Attorney General Ashcroft further wants to authorize the FBI to go after any religious and political organization in the United States that might be in suspect. We've nationalized airport security. There even are moves to restore the draft, legalize the use of torture by the police in interrogating suspects, institute a national ID card, and the list goes on and on. Clearly, these are measures that before 9-11, none of us would have not considered, none of us would have considered to be even feasible for discussion in a serious manner. History teaches that 
uh, periods of crisis, especially during wartime, can often create even greater problems in addition to the crisis itself. And the crises that, that develop as a result are caused in many respects by the crowding out of civil society by an expanding government. Uh, one of our senior fellows is the economist Robert Higgs, who I mentioned, who is also the author of this book. It's called Crisis and Leviathan. And it's a book that discusses many of these kinds of matters. The question that um, we wanted to address is, in overcoming the new threat of terrorism, and in just generally looking at the many social and economic problems that people face, must freedom be restricted? Is freedom during wartime and recession as important as during peacetime and prosperity? What is the relevance of individual, individual choice in free markets to such matters as safety, education, health, the environment, community, culture, and much more? David Henderson is Associate Professor of Economics at the Naval Postgraduate School. He's also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He received his PhD in economics from UCLA. He's taught economics at Santa Clara University, St. Louis University, and the University of Rochester. And he served as senior economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He's also the editor of an important book called The Fortune Encyclopedia of Economics, which I also strongly encourage everyone to get. It's a, it's a wonderful book, especially for anyone interested in learning about economics. His scholarly study, studies have appeared in many top journals. He's a very prolific author in the popular press, with his pieces having appeared in the New York Times, Fortune, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, and many other publications, including various high-tech magazines such as The Red Herring. He's testified before numerous government agencies. We're very pleased to have David with us, and uh, um, after his talk, we'll be happy to uh, field any questions that you might have. So David? Thank you, David, and thank you. Well, David uh, laid out a lot of the threats to liberty, and I will get to those, but I want to talk about some good things for a while. And in fact, as you can tell, the joy of freedom, I really think freedom is joyous. And I want to start by telling you something that I just learned about a year or two ago. And in fact, this is the first paragraph of my book. For the last two centuries, economics has been called the dismal science. The person who coined the phrase was the British anti-capitalist author Thomas Carlyle. Now, I'd always thought that what he had in mind was Thomas Malth Robert Malthus, the population economist who said that population growth would outstrip agricultural output, thus causing mass, star mass starvation. <coughs> Wrong. Economics is a dismal science, wrote Carlyle, because the free market economists of his time, who dominated economics in the 19th century, strongly opposed slavery. Economics is dismal because economists don't like slavery. Interesting view of dismal. Well, for me, economics has always been the joyous science because it says that a good deal of freedom is necessary for prosperity, which means not only can you have freedom, but also you get prosperity as a bonus. So that's always been the draw of me for, on me for economics, of economics. There's a chapter in my book titled The Joy of Capitalism. And when I was working on my, just the final little draft of that chapter one Sunday morning about 5 a.m., the title of the book suddenly occurred to me, The Joy of Freedom. That's what the whole book is about. And I lead off that chapter with a quote from a friend of mine who died about nine years ago that some of you in the audience may know, a man named Roy Childs. And he said this, and I remember writing it down, and fortunately I wrote the date down. He said this in 1988, and this is how I led that chapter off. Ultimately, capitalism will beat socialism because capitalism is more fun. <laughs> A year later, the Berlin Wall fell. Now, I started out as, in, as an undergrad in mathematics, and I was reading a lot of economics on the side. I read Ayn Rand, and I really liked a lot of what Ayn Rand had to say. 
and then my libertarian friends who were a couple years older led me to people like Milton Friedman, Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, Henry Hazlitt, and I was learning a lot. But one of my calculus professors said, well, when we'd get, we'd get in these arguments, and after, I, here's one, an interesting thing I noticed, and, and I'm, part of this is to say why I'm talking so much about economics tonight, even though I know it's been pitched as a thing about civil liberties, and I'm gonna get to those, but, but economics is really relevant here. Because what I've found in almost every discussion I was ever in, in those days and since, is that when people start arguing about their principles, within one or two or at most three rounds of the discussion, it turns to practice. The big problem people had with freedom was, does it work? And I would be arguing with my, my calculus professor, this one particular person, and I would kind of back him into a corner and he'd say, well, look, I admit you backed me into a corner, but I'm just a humble mathematician. I bet you the economists could take you on. Why don't you go over to the economics department and argue with them? <laughs> and I thought, you know, you're right. Maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something here. So I took economics in my last year of college, and we had a book by, that many of you might be familiar with by a man named Paul Samuelson. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Canada, and we had the Canadian version, which was... Samuelson and Anthony Scott was the Canadian author for the Canadian content part. And uh, it didn't cover any of the issues that libertarians were interested in, but it didn't really cover any of the issues that liberals were interested in. In other words, it wasn't covering the stuff everyone was arguing about. So I kind of gave up on the idea of going into economics. And then something happened in my last semester of college. Our libertarian group had a man from the University of Chicago come to our school named Harold Demsetz. And Demsetz kind of opened my eyes in two days of three talks over two days to what economics had to say. And I have a, a chapter in the book titled Hooked on Economics, and I talk about some of the things I learned from him. One of the things was that free markets make discrimination on racial grounds costly. Free markets make it costly to discriminate against people on any grounds other than their productivity. Because if you refuse to hire people who are productive, you're gonna miss out on good people. Similarly, if you're a landlord and you refuse to hire, to rent to someone who's the wrong color, you're gonna miss out on potentially good tenants. Now, it doesn't mean that people won't discriminate. What it means is when you discriminate, you pay a cost and the higher the cost, the less discrimination. Whereas government regulations often make the cost of discriminating on racial grounds zero. And the example Demsetz gave was that in American cities during World War II, uh, governments imposed rent controls. A rent control keeps the price below what the market price would have been. So at the lower price, People want to rent more apartments, but landlords want to rent fewer apartments. They, are, they don't have as much of an incentive to rent them out. And so you have a shortage. When you have a shortage, the cost of discriminating is effectively zero because you've got lots of people to choose from. And what he found by going through Chicago Tribune ads over the war period was as the shortage got worse, the percentage of ads in the Chicago Tribune that said this is restricted, restricted was the code word in those days, that percentage went up. Now, there's another really great example of this in a recent movie, a movie in the 90s. It's one of my favorite movies, titled Schindler's List. Who here has seen Schindler's List? Think about what happened there. Think of the first half of the movie. What Schindler did, he, he cared about one thing. He cared about making money. That's all he cared about. He had no concern for these people he, he employed, but he noticed that the German war office was charging out Jews at five units an hour, I've forgotten the units, and, and non-Jewish Poles at seven units an hour. And he said, aha, I can make money hiring Jews. And that's what he did. Now, he didn't pay them. He paid the money to the German Reich office, which is, by the way, the way uh, Castro does it in Cuba. When, when people hire these workers at high wages, they pay the wages to Castro, who then gives a tiny pittance to the workers in Cuba. But something happened halfway through the movie. And some of the critics, and I talk about this in the book, some of the critics described it as 
puzzling, contradictory. This man is strange. He started to like the people he worked with. Boy, is that strange. <laughs> he didn't have a Marxist cardboard character view of humans. Wow. And that's kind of relevant nowadays. I, I want to point out a couple things that happened on September 11th that got a lot of press for the first couple of days and then have just kind of disappeared. Because we've heard that the heroes are firemen and policemen and medical people, and they were the heroes. They were heroes, but they weren't the heroes. They were some of the heroes. There were other heroes, too. I have a friend who has a friend who run, ran a small business in the World Trade Center. When the airplane hit the building, first thing he did, this owner of this business, was stood up and said, everyone out. He didn't say, hey, let's get 20 more minutes of work, and then let's get out. The point is that uh, we often hear, and again, this is kind of the propaganda about capitalism, the propaganda about markets, that employers are cruel, employers don't care about people. And yet, if you're an employer, you know this. If you've known employers, you know this. What's one of the toughest things employer, what's one of the things employers hate most about their job? Firing people. And, and that shouldn't be surprising. And I have a chapter talking about this at greater length, about how markets breed virtue. Because see, one of the things that, uh, um, the, the kind of the latest hit on capitalism is the following. It's true that markets produce the goods. It's true that capitalism works to produce the goods. By the way, that's a recent admission. If you look at Samuelson's 1985 edition, you'll find him saying in there that the Soviet Union is going to really produce, it's producing well, it's going to grow well, because socialism works by you know, forcing labor and diverting resources where they're most needed and so on. Was that the president saying they need in 1990? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's a recent admission. Now, in fact, as soon as the wall fell, I found out something interesting. I noticed a lot of liberal economists saying, you know, isn't it great that capitalism works and isn't it great that socialism fell? And I'm, I, I want, there was a part of me that wanted to write an article saying, well, but remember what you were saying a few years ago? But there's another part that said, no, accept them. I mean, if, they, if they're now saying that, that's great. We've got them on our side. Let's go. But here's back to what I was saying. They were, people said, sure, capitalism produces the goods, but it's short on virtue. Well, I've got a chapter in there titled Market Virtues and Community, in which I lay out how actually markets do create virtue. Because one of the biggest virtues in life is accountability. And that's what markets create. You don't make it very far if you're not accountable. You, and, and a good comparison is compare FedEx and the US, US Postal Service. Compare FedEx and what do they call the overnight thing that's kind of overnight? Uh, Postal Express. When I hired a research assistant when I was working on my Fortune Encyclopedia, I gave her a couple rules the first day, and the first rule was, don't use Postal Express. She said, don't mail things overnight? I said, no, 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 don't use Postal Express. Mail them overnight. <laughs> and the point is, why the difference? Because with Federal Express, there's someone accountable. There's someone who, in economics jargon, is called the residual claimant. There's someone who's responsible whose assets or wealth or well-being are on the line. In the post office, if I have a problem and I work my way up my chain and I don't ever bother working my way up the chain, I get all the way to the top, William Henderson, no relation, <laughs> and he can't do anything even if he wants to. His hands are tied. So there's a real accountability in day-to-day -day activity. And it's so present, and here's the problem, it's so present that we forget to take account of it. It's so present that we often aren't even aware of it. How does that relate to some of the things going on now? Well, look at the issue of airport security. And in fact, well, let's go there and then I want to go to another point about airport security. Jay Leno put it best the other night. He said, we've got now federal employees are going to be running airport security. So not only are they incompetent, but you can't fire them. <laughs> How is that going to work? How is that going to get us more airport security? No one laid out how. In fact, the Democrats pitched it as, this is so important, we want the federal government to run it. 
The obvious comeback for Bush would have been to give the Federal Express, Postal Express, po po overnight U.S. Postal Express type comparison, and he didn't do it. And so the Democrats won by, by pitching the issue in a way that, you know, it's important. If, it, if it's important, well, then, of course, the government should run it. But there was no comeback. And that means the people who are going to be running, and think about the difference. First of all, I want to note something that has been undernoted. You know, everyone's been pointing to the, what's Argenbright, that's one of the security firms, and other firms that are running, that have been running uh, airport security and how they're paying low wages and they have a high turnover and the, it's a move up to work at uh, Cinnabon and so on. <laughs> but interestingly, the thing that happened on September 11th wasn't due to anyone making a mistake. The things that got through were completely legal. So yes, you could point to incompetence many times. There were people who got guns through in the past. But the point is, what they did, did was completely consistent with the rules they were supposed to follow. So it was the rules that were wrong. It wasn't the enforcers. And so what do we get? And by the way, notice that the airlines who were hiring these people had some trade-off they had to make between security and speed, security and convenience. If the airline hassled you too much, you miss your flight, and then they're in trouble. But if the federal government is running it, and you miss your flight, tough. Too bad. That's, that's not their concern. And that's what we're going to be facing fairly soon. Also notice, by the way, we're going to be facing that from the same organization that still thinks it's important to tell us how to fasten a seatbelt. I remember there used to be an airline around here called Morris Air, which was bought out later by Southwest, I believe. And I remember flying Morris Air from, uh, from uh, San Jose to Phoenix, I believe, and the woman coming on and saying, for those of you who don't know how to fasten a seatbelt, which means those of you who haven't been in a car since, oh, about 1962, I mean, that's the point. They have these crazy rules. Or the other one, has anyone unknown to you asked you to carry something? Have you been away from your bag? You know, all these things. These are the things they think of as important. I don't see how we've solved anything. I think we've added a huge problem. Moreover, I was giving a talk on this in Washington about six weeks ago, and I was telling some of these same stories. And someone, uh, Chris DeMuth, the head of the American Enterprise Institute, told a story. He said that Delta Airlines, about two days after September 11th, had noticed their bookings going way down and were seeing their airline at risk and came up with a plan. And it was to hire retired FBI agents to carry guns on their planes. And they had a whole advertising. They started thinking through an advertising campaign, you know, fly with us and you're safe. And they called up the FAA and said, you know, we want permission to have retired FBI agents carrying guns. And the FAA said, no, you can't. So not only are they not going to do a good job of providing security, they're actively preventing the airlines from providing security. Interestingly, by the way, Europe has many private airports. Maggie Thatcher denationalized 17 of them. And there's a whole lot more of a private role in security in England. One of the things that I learned from uh, well, I put together in my second chapter a list of 10 what I came to call pillars of economic wisdom. And at the start of every course, I always lay out these pillars and go through various examples of them. And I won't go through all of them here, but there's one that um, I want to point out, and that is what's sometimes called the law of unintended consequences. When you do something in order to achieve a certain end, you may achieve that end you also necessarily achieve other ends, some of which might not be your purpose, and sometimes it's so perverse that you achieve the opposite of your end. And we see that with many government policies. The example I give in the, in the book is, the, uh, is how Ralph Nader essentially created the SUV. <laughs> Ralph Nader, and I gotta give credit to where it's due, Ralph Nader and Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford pushed something called, or signed into law, something called the CAFE law, corporate average fuel economy, that required that auto companies achieve a certain number of miles per gallon on their whole fleet year. 
and had a separate small lower requirement for trucks. That was what economists call a binding constraint. In other words, it kept that average higher than the market would have yielded, especially when it was passed at a time of very high oil prices, and then of course oil prices started dropping. So people wanted the bigger cars. This was one of my issues during, uh, well, I, I should go back. Nixon gets some credit here too. Why did we have this big problem? It was because there were these price controls that Nixon imposed on August 5th, 19th, 15th, 1971 that caused shortages throughout the economy. When the OPEC price increase hit in the fall of 1973, prices were not allowed to go up at the retail level, so we had shortages of gasoline, people sometimes murdering to get gas. There were a number of killings at the time. And that was, and so people were trying to get more gas than was available. You could, the government could have responded by just getting rid of price controls. They didn't do that. Instead, they said, look at how wasteful people are. Huh. We're keeping the price artificially low, and people are acting as if we're keeping the price artificially low. <laughs> what pigs? And in fact, some of Carter's officials, Jimmy Carter's officials, later on called us energy pigs. Well, so if they're going to do that, then the next call is for all kinds of regulations to prevent us from using so much fuel, and the CAFE regulations were part of it. Well, this was one of my issues when I was the energy economist at the Council of Economic Advisors under Reagan in the early, early 1980s, CAFE laws, and I wanted to get rid of them. What I noticed was that station wagons were disappearing. And I wrote an article, and it's obvious why, because they get less fuel economy and they were bringing down the average too much. And I wrote an article about this after I left the council. You're a lot more restricted in what you can write about when you're there, which is one of the big negatives of the job. You forget how to, how to write, well, no, you, you learn how to write quickly, memos that you, you, you forget how to write to a general audience. So I wrote an article about this laying out how the station wagon would, was disappearing and would disappear, and also pointing out that it also explained why small truck sales were rising dramatically. Because the tr small truck average was 21, the, the car average was 27.5 miles per gallon. What I did not anticipate, but should have, is the creativity of Detroit. Because Detroit said, hmm, we want something that fits as a truck, but kind of looks like a station wagon. Thus the SUV. Now how does Ralph Nader get in this? Well, I have a a little segment in the book where I, ha I lay out, I had an a hour and a half long interview with Ralph Nader that was really about an hour and 25 minute long argument after, <laughs> after the niceties. And what I was trying to get, here's some other background. How do you make, how do you get a car to fit within the cafe laws? You make it lighter. But when you make it lighter, it becomes less safe. And economists at Harvard and Brookings Institution found that the CAFE laws in the model year 89 would cause about 2,000 extra deaths a year. In other words, two-thirds of a World Trade Center every year. And I was basically trying to get Ralph Nader to admit that in the trade-off between regulation and safety, he'd chosen regulation. And he wasn't going to go there. But it was fun trying. <laughs> and in a way, his, his associate Clarence Ditlow of the Center for Auto Safety did go there. He said, you're never going to get me to admit that. Well, it's kind of like admitting it. Um, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, unintended consequences. There's one major unintended consequence of something that Congress is about to pass. I don't follow it day to day because they are doing so much. You cannot follow it day to day. By the way, they can't follow it day to day. Most of the people who voted for the USA Patriot Act did not read it. Yes, yes. So I'm not sure if this one has passed. I believe it has not passed, but it's close. And that is legislation that would essentially subsidize insurance against terrorism. Now, in economics, in the economics of insurance, there's something called moral hazard. Moral hazard is this. When you have insurance, in other words, when the downside of your actions is somewhat covered, you have less incentive to avoid the downside. Moral hazard is thought of as a negative. If moral hazard is big enough, insurance won't exist because it won't be worth it. Uh, so for example, you get life insurance, you're more likely to do risky activities after you've gotten life insurance because you're covered. Well, 
it's interesting to look at the arguments that are being made for subsidies of terror, anti-terrorism insurance. The, the main argument made is that there will be moral hazard. Why do I say that? Well, the people who are pushing it are saying, if terrorism insurance isn't subsidized, either insurance companies aren't going to offer it, or they're going to price it high. If they price it high, people are not going to have an incentive to build in the high-risk areas, and economic activity is going to disperse. So we want to prevent economic activity from dispersing. It's like saying, as we do with the, we have flood insurance, we have the federal government fund flood insurance. It's like saying we want people to locate on floodplains. By the way, the federal government is acting as if we do want people to locate on floodplains. It's highly subsidized, and that's why we get this destruction. Now, one of the there's just a lot of little things you hear through your life, and you kind of go along with them, and you don't really think about them. I think one of the neat things about economics is if it's done right, it gets you thinking about them. And let me quote one from a senator from Minnesota named, I keep blanking on his name, West, uh, Wellstone, Wellstone. About a year and a half ago, he said something, he said words like the following about the pharmaceutical companies. They want to make money off people's sickness. And he said it with a you know, negative connotation. Now, it got me thinking, and I realized, you know, he's right. They do want to make money off people's sickness, just as food companies want to make money off people's hunger. <laughs> but food companies don't try to make money by making us more hungry. They try to make money by feeding us. Similarly, drug companies don't try to make money by making us sicker. They try to make money by making us more well. Six years ago, I had an incident where I started to lose bodily fluids and I lost 10 pounds in 24 hours. And I was so delirious, I couldn't even make a decision about what to do and my wife decided to send me to the hospital. So I went to the hospital and it's the community hospital of the Monterey Peninsula. We locals call it CHOMP. And they put me in this beautiful white bed and they pumped these fluids in my arm. I still remember how cold it felt. And I slept for 22 out of the next 24 hours. When my wife and daughter came to visit me in the morning, I didn't even know they were there. And my doctor later told me that they saved my life, that if I hadn't gone in, my, my body would have been destroyed. And it had already gone to the point where he said every cell in my body was damaged. It took me weeks to recover. Think about that. When I, and, and by the way, I did think about it. I think about these things, not just... Am I ever glad my life was saved? But thinking more about the economics of it, too, because the people who saved my life were people I didn't even know. They were strangers. And yet they gave their best effort, or at least good enough effort, to save me. And for the next few months after that, when I would drive by Chomp, if I had a passenger in my car with me, I'd cheer. And if I didn't have a passenger, I'd blow a kiss. That's how happy I felt about them. I wanted them to make money off my sickness. See. I'm 51, and I don't want to get Parkinson's, and I don't want to get Alzheimer's, and I don't want to get, what was that other one? Uh, okay. uh, I don't want to get cancer. Or if I get them, I want them to be low, not that bad. And, and I might not get them, but I don't want my friends to get them either. And this is the really neat thing about capitalism and free markets, that there are people out there in the world whom I don't know, whom I'll never know, who are spending their time up late at night trying to figure out ways to make me well. They don't know about me. They don't care about me. If they met me, they might not even like me. And yet, they are doing this. Now, this is essentially the, the I call it the Adam Smith eye pencil insight. Two stories. Adam Smith, everyone's heard of him. He once said, in one of the most famous line of the book, it is not from the benevolence of the brewer, the butcher, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own self-interest. In other words, they aren't doing it to be nice guys to us, but they find the way to do well for themselves is to be nice guys to us by producing the goods. 
Well, similarly, there's a famous uh, man named Leonard Reed who wrote an article, it's a classic article in 1958 called I Pencil, in which he holds up, uh, oops, I got I, I Pen, the best I can do. He holds, or it, El, Milton Friedman drew on this in his Free to Choose series. It's the pencil talking, and the pencil says, no one knows how to make me. It's a literally true statement that no one knows how to make me. Well, then, how do I get made? Well, because each individual in a, in a division of labor of millions of individuals knows one little piece of it. No one even knows how to make the wood in me. That's an incredible division of labor. No one knows how to make the lead. That's an incredible, incredible division of labor. And it's brought together all in one. If we were to try to do it on our own, we would fail. And there's this, but the thing is, the market leads to this division of labor where there are people all over the world working together, coordinating, the price system coordinates them without any central planner. And as a result, you get this pencil that costs a couple of pennies to produce. And think about that. If you try to produce on your own, you could spend a year, and you would not have as good a pencil as you can get for about 10 cents at the store. That's incredible. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I used to, I, lived in, I grew up in a small town in Midwestern Canada. When we'd go into the city, the first few times, I'd, the city of Winnipeg, half a million population, I would worry a little. I mean, I knew pretty much everyone in my town, but I didn't know these people, these strangers in the city. Well, gee, I go, get there and I want to get something. Who will do it for me? How will I get it? How, why will they be nice to me? They don't even know me. And bit by bit, I understood the market, that they had incentives to be nice to me. And that, in fact, I got to admit, even now when I travel to a place like New York, you know, the little hick in me comes out and I get all worried about, you know, how will they treat me? And of course, people in New York are wonderful. And the market works. Um, on that issue, I just want to point out that there's an economist who just really nailed this issue some years ago, and his name was Joseph Schumpeter, about the incredible productivity of the market. And he, I, I quoted this in, in my chapter, The Joy of Capitalism, he pointed out that the virtue of capitalism is not he says, he says, Queen Elizabeth had silk stockings. The virtue of capitalism is not that rich people get silk stockings. The virtue of capitalism is that poor people get silk stockings or get nylons or get whatever after the rich people have had them a few years. And it's really interesting just to look back. There are two kinds of comparisons to make. One is with 300 years ago and now. And what I always like to do is, is think about travel. Think about when you traveled 300 years ago. The only, the only two groups really traveled, the really rich people who had a horrible time of it. They had to you know, be in the elements, the cold, the heat, and so on, without air conditioning, without warmth. And the really poor people who were drafted and sent off to the Crusades. That was it. Now, we can travel halfway around the world for what in America is less than half of an average person's <coughs> monthly salary, and we can do it in about 7 to 15 hours. And our idea of a tough trip <laughs> is that our knees were cramped and the person beside us talked too much. And we got a little dry. That's our idea of a tough trip. Capitalism is that great. Capitalism is that productive. But you can make comparisons even with much shorter time periods. I think I'm 51. When I was 10 years old, we spent Christmas with a family, and their precocious five-year-old daughter had a crush on me. So she, she chased me around the house until my pants split. We were a half a block from home, so I went home and changed pants. Came back, she chased me again. My pants split. I was out of options. I had two pairs of pants. I had one pair of shoes. And I wasn't from some poor family. I was from just a family with an income below the median in Canada, which is only a little below the median in the United States at the time. That's the way things were. Think now where I have a friend who makes $15,000 a year, and he showed me his closet one day, and he's got these beautiful sweaters and shirts and pants. Got a lot of them at Goodwill. But isn't that interesting that Goodwill sells these things, really nice things, cheap? Now... <laughs> I've kind of talked a lot about markets and how markets work, and I haven't really talked about government except that one case with Postal Express, so I want to say a few things about government. 
and then I want to say a few things about civil liberties, if I can get there. I have a chapter in this book titled A Tour of Washington. I had two tours in Washington in a sense. I was a summer intern in the White House when that meant something a little different. <laughs> <laughs> One difference was I was paid. And at the Council of Economic Advisors, as a matter of fact. And I remember my first day in Washington. I flew overnight through Atlanta on the cheap Delta line, airline out of LA to Washington. I got out of the cab. And it was, I hadn't slept at all on that flight. I got out of the cab at the old executive office building. And I looked, and there over the old executive office building was a huge Soviet flag. And I just had little enough sleep that for a split second I thought, oh my God. <laughs> they took over overnight. <laughs> and then I saw people kind of walking normally along the street, and then the thought was, uh-oh, invasion of the body snatchers. No, uh, no, no. So I went to the old executive office building and checked in. And while I'm waiting to be allowed in past the Secret Service, I asked one of the Secret Service guys, you know, about why the Soviet flag is there. And he says, oh, because Brezhnev is in town. And we're doing it as a courtesy. And I thought, wow. Brezhnev represents the most murderous regime, murderous regime in history. And in fact, they haven't admitted even that they've murdered, let alone apologized for it. And we're putting up his flag. I wondered what other tyrant might come to town whose flag we would put up. I didn't have to wait long. That summer, the green flag from Iran was up as the Shah visited. And as I went through the day, I noticed that people, when I'd asked secretaries, senior economists, anyone about this, they didn't seem at all surprised. They, they, it was just normal course for this is what you do. Which made me go back to the body snatchers again. And, and I realized that Washington was going to be a strange place. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the summer of price controls, when the price controls were causing all these shortages. And I have a number of stories about that in, in the book, about how I tried successfully to avoid working in favor of, of the price controls. Uh, and then I went back again in the early 80s as a senior economist at the same place, Council of Economic Advisors, and I had other experiences there. But I started that summer with an unsettling thought. But I am an empiricist. It's one reason, by the way, I've never been an Austrian economist. Sorry, David. They're not, they aren't nearly empirical enough for me. We're just empiricists. <laughs> And, and I always like to look at the facts and not just go with uh, a priorism. Not just go, you know, not just theory, but look at some facts. And so I didn't start out being positive of this, but I was wondering this. I was wondering, does government care about us? Does the gov do government officials in their day-to-day -day activities really care about us? And I was starting to think they don't. That's what I was starting to think based on things I'd read at the start of the summer. By the end of the summer, I was had an even higher probability on the idea that they don't. And then I went back there in the 80s for about two and a half years and came out positive that they don't. And I have a title, that my chapter is titled A Tour of Washington. And, and the analogy, here's the analogy that I have with, with Washington and with government generally. It's a movie that they keep showing endlessly on American movie classics. It's called The Getaway with Ally McGraw and Steve McQueen. Where they're bad guys, but they aren't quite as bad as the other bad guys. And they're fighting over the loot. And in their fighting over the loot, they're, they're, they're destroying lots of property held by innocent people. I would guess $50,000 worth of property at least. An elevator, a bunch of cars, etc. And they don't care about the property they're destroying. And about the third time I saw that on AMC one night, I thought, you know what? That's the government. <laughs> The government does things because it's pursuing very narrow ends. The government officials are pursuing their ends. And they don't care about, what would we call it, collateral damage. Uh, good example, steel quotas. Economists have estimated that steel quotas designed to save U.S. jobs cost the U.S. economy, cost the U.S. consumer $750,000 a year per job saved. That's a year per job saved, and a job is a $40,000 job. Why? Because they are focusing on the interest group that wants those jobs. They don't care about the consumers whose interests are dispersed and don't even, aren't even aware of the cost to them. And yes, <laughs> they the, buy them off instead. And so that kind of, for me, stands for a lot of what government does. Government 
we, we hear that government has incentives to take account of everything, but in fact, it's just the opposite. Markets, if, if things are privately owned, markets take account of everything, because someone has everything, each individual thing at risk. But if governments are making decisions and they don't have to pay the consequences, they don't take account of everything. In fact, they don't take account of much. And there are many examples like this. And actually, I think this gets me to civil liberties. When I wrote this book, I didn't, no, no, that's not true. Let me see. I wrote an article in Red Herring in November 99. I urge you to check my website, www.davidrhenderson.com, and check an article called Booming, How Booming Cannons Hurt Booming Economies, in which I anticipated something like a terrorist attack that would kill a few thousand people. And I even anticipated that one of the big things that would happen then is a push to remove civil liberties. I guess I didn't anticipate that it would be so quick or so massive. But I think that's what's going on is government has this very narrow end. At its best, the narrow end is to prevent future terrorist attacks. That's at its best. But in fact, if you look at the details, each agency coming forth with its pet program has its own narrow ends. So for example, the FBI comes up with carnivore, which by the way, they had come up with some years ago. And they aren't just going to use it to go after terrorists. They're going to use it to go after lots of people, including maybe people in this audience, maybe people watching it on TV. The Office of Homeland Security basically was set up based on a draft that had been created over the last few years. The new regulations on financial, financial regulations where the government is going to know even more about your bank account were regulations that were rejected because of a massive writing campaign a couple of years ago. It's called Know Your Customer, and they were knocked down like crazy. And now they're back. They're in. And so these various people, these various players, had their own narrow ends they were trying to achieve. Here was a crisis that was a great excuse to do it. Now, am I sympathetic with the idea of maybe on the margin cutting back on some civil liberties in order to go after specific cases of terrorism? I am. Not in the sense I favor them, in the sense I'm willing to look at them. But that's not what's going on. What's going on is wholesale <clears throat> massive reductions in civil liberties with no focus going after lots of people that has nothing to do with terrorism. By the way, one of the things uh, defined in the USA Patriot Act is domestic terrorism. By the way, the, the, um, the attack on September 11th broke three different terrorist laws. In other words, we already have laws in the books that they broke. And, of course, they murdered. But the domestic terrorism includes threatening government officials. It also includes harboring people who might have committed some kind of violence. Now, I'm not someone who believes in violence. But let's say my daughter, who turned 17 yesterday, uh, becomes a Marxist in two years. Perish the thought, but let's say she does. And she becomes one of these anti-global people who wants to keep people in third world starving. I hope she doesn't, but let's say she does. And she goes to an IMF conference, and she uh, hits a cop or something. And then she comes home and lives with me. I'm harboring a domestic terrorist. That, and that's, that's a serious crime. So the government is actually going to put people in the position of being criminals who never thought they'd be criminals for the standard, normal, everyday things they're doing. That's the kind of thing that's going on. Now, when should I? I, I want to wrap, wrap up, but I don't want to. I got another five minutes. Okay. I, <laughs> I want to go to a, a heavy topic, but with a little light note for a minute. I have a chapter in here titled, Maybe We Can't End Death, But Let's Take a Shot at Taxes. <laughs> and there's a great, st and, and I kind of, I like starting off, as you'll see if you read the book, I like starting off a lot of these chapters with my own story and then going <clears throat> to other people's stories. And I remember just the shock when I was 16 and I went up, or when I was 18, I went up to a city in northern Canada and got a job in the summer working in a mine to make money to pay for my last year of college and uh, hadn't filled out the form right, and so I had all this money withheld, and then I had to beg them with a, the equivalent of a 1040 form to get it back. And I couldn't fill it out, because I, I was begging the government. I could not make myself fill it out, so I had to get my brother to do it for me. I signed it. 
And I was reminded of that when I read a news article about Venus Williams in September 2000. Miss Williams had just won the U.S. Open at the tender age of 19 and received a check for $800,000. President Clinton called to congratulate her, and Miss Williams recounted that conversation to an L.A. Times reporter. He, this is her talking. He said, you really worked hard. I said, see, I did work hard, and I want to keep this for me. I'm a good citizen. Can you lower my taxes, please? <laughs> this is me talking. Clinton then had the gall to say there wasn't much he could do about it. Although maybe he could go out and get a lower rate for athletes. <laughs> Wasn't much he could do about it. That's not what he thought in 1993 when the tax increase he proposed, signed, and bragged about was implemented. A tax increase that cost Miss Williams more than $80,000 of her $800,000 win. The president can do a lot about taxes. If he had decided to seek repeal of his 93 tax increase, he would have had enough Republican votes, that was the summer of 2000, to pull it off. And he could have cut taxes retroactively also just as he imposed them retroactively. I know this may sound shocking, but President Clinton lied. Oh, what? <laughs> maybe Miss Williams knew some of this history, and maybe that's why she went on to ask him whether he was asking her to read his lips. <laughs> now, the last chapter of my book is titled Freedom in Our Time. And I lead it off with a, one of my favorite quotes from Aristotle. The philosophy that can't help you do things does nothing. So the whole point of this is to do something. And I lay out a number of things you can do, and I won't, don't want to just dwell on them. I want to just mention a couple of things. One is to be creative. To, I'll give you an example. My mother died of cancer. My wife had cancer. She's alive and well. And I give to the American Cancer Society. But what I've been thinking about lately is there's probably an even more effective way to fight cancer. And that is to fight the regulations on drug companies. Because the people who are going to solve cancer are not likely to be the American Cancer Society, wonderful as those people are. The people who are going to fight cancer are the people who are going to make a lot of money doing it. And I want them to do it quickly, which means I want the FDA to deregulate. And I lay out in my health chapter how that can be done with everyone being better off, and I owe some of that reasoning to my friend Charlie Hooper, who's in the audience, who's a consultant to drug companies. So there's one. So I remember one time when my father wanted to give some money in my name to an old folks, in my, name, in my mother's name to an old folks home, and in my name, I had him give it to an organization in Washington instead that was fighting laws against, uh, that was fighting to, re to relax laws against drugs. Um, also, there's one thing we can do that I think people underestimate that I think is really important, and that is speak out. The number of times I run into people, uh, Milton Friedman tells a story in his book, and his and his wife's book, Two Lucky People, about how over the years people have said to him, gee, Mr. Friedman, Professor Friedman, you are so courageous to say those things. And he said, you know, I never felt courageous. And when I looked at the consequences, I never saw any really bad consequences from speaking my mind. People just imagine there are all these bad consequences from speaking their mind, and if they're pleasant about it, and if they actually, and by the way, an important thing is to listen to what the other person says back, not just speechify, then there's very little to lose. And so I give a few examples of things that one might do uh, uh, when, when people, um, and I can't find it here. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll just wing it. When someone says, let's raise taxes, ask them if you can have their wallet. <laughs> when, a, when a male says, let's prevent gays from getting married, ask them if they would have liked a government to prevent them from getting married to their spouse. If someone says, let's regulate drug companies, ask them if they want their children to have a better chance or a worse chance of surviving in life. There's a lot of things we can do, and we just have to be a little creative about it. I also think we should thank people who do little things for freedom. And I gave an example. I spoke at an event a few years ago, which one of the other speakers was Charles Stenholm, a Democratic congressman from Texas. I remember that almost 20 years earlier, his crossover vote had been important in getting Ronald Reagan's package of budget cuts. They were small, but they were real. And tax cuts approved. So I thanked him. Did that man look surprised? I don't think congressmen are used to getting thanked at all, let alone for a vote they had 20 years ago. And I want to end with one of my favorite quotes about 
a famous, by a famous libertarian about the most libertarian, the most pro-freedom fight in our nation's history, and that was the fight against slavery. And the libertarian was Frederick Douglass. And he said the following, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who perhaps profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who, men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the mighty roar of its awful waters. This struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them, and these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. So let's stop settling. Let's speak out when our freedom is violated, and even better, let's do the same when the freedom of others is violated. It's not too late to seek a freer world. Thank you. Thank you, David. We have uh, time for questions. Um, Carl has a microphone, and if you'd hold it horizontally when, uh, and speak, uh, make your question short if you can. I want to add to your concerns. Uh, the Secretary of Health, Tommy Thompson, has sent a model <coughs> emergency health care act to all the states asking the governor, the state legislatures, to pass an, an act that would allow the governor by fiat to take over the entire health care of his state yeah. upon his decision. Yes. And no one could interfere with that decision in less than 60 days when the legislature could vote it out. If you're not aware of this existence, one should look into it yes. because there are penalties and possibly jail terms for those that, let's say, won't allow themselves to be vaccinated or a doctor who won't do a vaccination. Be aware, yes. look into it, it's draconian. Yes, I was just reading about it the other day. One of the other provisions is it would actually allow the government to draft doctors. To draft doctors. Right so much of what you said is, is very agreeable. Uh, it seems to me, and reciprocity as a device for producing accountability seems very, uh, very necessary. But what you did, it seemed to me, was to denigrate government and what it really does produce. And it seemed to me there were some cheap shots that were taken. After all, the reason why we can travel seven and uh, so comfortably, all of us, is that we do have some protection against marauders and pirates and so forth that only kings had in the old days. So government does some things well, right. and it does some things badly. And there is almost an invisible hand that works in government the way it works in the marketplace. After all, what you said was that business people really don't care about the people that they're helping and assisting, but there is a it's kind of unintended consequence that it does help. And government in the same way does, especially because of the, the fact that we have two houses of Congress or two houses every place else. We have appeals. We have tons of people participating. We have an open, open market of ideas. And the result is that all those horrible examples that you were throwing out probably aren't going to be passed into law. And the few that get through are probably going to be knocked down by courts. You know, it's an extraordinary going, thing. I was Going along with a lot of what you were saying, <laughs> government does provide protection. And by the way, I, I'm an agnostic on this. I don't know how good a job it does. I do note that we did pay $300 billion a year, and we thought we were getting homeland defense, and it turns out we weren't. But, but it does provide protection. Uh, I think the oceans do an awfully good job at it, too. That's a major factor in our protection from foreign invaders. Um, but, but no, the fact is a lot of these laws do get through, and they become part of what we accept as a given. And in fact, Robert Higgs, whom David mentioned earlier in his book, uh, this really good book, I, I reviewed this for Fortune in 1987. It's one of my favorite books of the 80s. He points out that during war, government takes on crisis powers and loses some of them after the war, but never goes back. And as for example, one example he gives, or it goes back with a long lag in this case, is prohibition. We think of prohibition as starting in 1920. Turned out it started during the war because of price controls. Price controls uh, kept the price of grain artificially low, so it caused a shortage of grain. 
it was hard to justify allocating limited grain to people who were going to distill it into whiskey. And so the government refused to allow it to be made in, into alcohol. And we got, under, I think it was called the Lever Act, we got prohibition during the war, and that softened up the American people. To, it was easy, easy to accept it back then in 1920. The draft was introduced during the World War I. It was eliminated at the end, but then it was introduced in 1940. It was eliminated for only one year, 1948, and then we had it until 1973. So the reality is uh, we, we lose freedoms and we get only some of them back. I'll give another example, taxation. Before the World, World War II, there was no withholding of taxes. You paid it every quarter. And you probably didn't pay it, or your counterparts didn't pay it, because it was the class tax. It was, it was taxed, it was on the highest income people. The government lowered the threshold at which it taxed people during World War II and introduced withholding to make them pay it on the installment plan, and never got rid of withholding, and from then on taxed a large percent of the American people. Uh, restrictions on freedom of speech, most of those go away, but, but not all of them. Uh, so, no, I, I disagree. I mean, look. We've got division of powers. We've got two houses. We've got, I love that. But what this president is doing is trying to get rid of that. He's trying by executive order and other things to get rid of that. And that's very dangerous. And Congress is letting him in a lot of these things. Congress still hasn't heard that in the Constitution, it's supposed to decide whether we're at war. And, and so we, we, it's alleged that we're at war, but we, the, the Congress has not declared war. And so there's one that went away sometime in the last century, and we've never got back. We've never had that division of powers. My question is involved rent control, and they have an open room every two months, and it's Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Garrett. I think that that's, I think you've laid out the facts right. And, and let me give a couple examples from New York, which I'm more familiar with. And uh, Ed Koch had an apartment, I don't know if he still has it, but he had a beautiful apartment for 200 and some dollars a month in Manhattan. Uh, Mia Farrow, similarly, had a nice apartment well under the, the market rent. And so it is people who know the rules better who, who, who get to take advantage of this. Uh, losers are, the losers are people who are new to the area. It's hard to move into a place like that. And for example, in, uh, in Prague, they've got heavy rent controls, and that's why, that's limiting the growth of the Czech economy. The unemployment rate is, in Prague is 2%. The unemployment rate in Czech Republic is a multiple of that. But people can't move there. Uh, and, by the way, the property owners are badly hurt. It's a myth, by the way, that all property owners are wealthy. I wrote something in rent control, and I used to live in the Bay Area in 1979 in the San Francisco Chronicle. And uh, a, a group of, in, of property owners in Berkeley invited me to speak. And I showed up and, you know, wearing my suit and this and that on a Saturday morning. And, and they showed up wearing uh, blue jeans. And, but it wasn't like the yuppies wearing blue jeans. It was kind of working class people. And for many of them, they owned one or two units that was, they had planned to be their retirement. And, and that was just eye-opening to me. Now, why do economists not get involved? There's a long answer, and I'll try to give the short one. Economists, by the way, if you, it, in a poll taken of economists in the late 1970s, 98% agreed, and this was out of 211 economists, 98% that rent control destroys housing. It's not controversial within economics. So if you could get economists involved, they would say that. The problem is economics has gone far away from having much to do with public policy or with communicating with the public. If you go to an economics department nowadays in the United States, almost invariably you will find courses, you'll find reading lists that don't seem to be about anything that would matter to you. And uh, I remember running into a reporter in the Bay Area some years ago who had been through the Stanford program and he dropped out. And I said, why'd you drop out of the graduate program in economics at Stanford? He said, well, when I got to the second course of an industrial organization class 
and it was just proof lemma, proof lemma, and we hadn't yet heard the word the firm, I thought there's something wrong here. So ec economics is, is more and more about kind of how many angels dance on the head of a pin and less and less about the real world. Now, if you can get a con economist to let his hair down, you'll hear some very sensible things. And in my fortune encyclopedia of economics, that was my goal. I was noticing this real coalescence among a lot, around a lot of issues, but it wasn't coming out to the public, and I wanted to do that. So I got economists who could write, and I found a whole lot of them. Um, but, but if you look at what is taught in graduate economics programs today, it isn't very useful. Thomas Sowell's most recent book, Basic Economics, there's a great chapter on rent control, laying it out from the start of it. Again, it started during wartime um, in Europe and the United States. Uh, I've also had very frustrating personal stories with the Pope and the Red Bear and the property owner in Cambridge, Massachusetts, off the Great Southern Road. It's amazing, it still exists. And, and in Berkeley, I can see the color of the line. To answer the gentleman's question over here was talking about maybe the legitimate roles of government. Sometimes that even gets skewed because uh, recently somebody asked a question to the Swiss who pay a, a large amount in, in uh, defense as a percentage of the budget. said, why do you continue to pay these huge defense expenditures when you haven't been, been invaded in 300 years? <laughs> but nobody, he didn't understand it. <laughs> There's an answer to that. Seen any tigers around here lately? <laughs> There's a question over here. We haven't been invaded in 300 years because they have a standing army that trains continuously. That's his point. That's his point. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Everybody has a gun at home, too. Since, um, since taxes tend to discourage what is taxed, a number of groups have focused on the idea of say, taxing pollution as a way of reducing pollution. And Milton Friedman has also said that the least bad tax is the tax on the bare value of land. I wonder if you could comment on is there, granted that many of the things that we do tax are awful, right. if you can comment on when, whether there is any such thing as a good tax and to the extent that we should have government, how should it be funded? Okay, good question. Uh, there are about three issues you raised because uh, <laughs> the one about taxing pollution, I used to be actually an advocate of taxing pollution, but the more I've read about it, the more I've thought about it, and the more I've just learned about some history, and I have, a, I have an art, a chapter in here I didn't get to tonight titled the environment, own it and save it. That the key to having the environment treated well is to have it, if just to have someone own it. And the second best, but it's a distant second best, is to tax pollution. And if you start thinking through the problems with taxing pollution, it's, it's just, it doesn't work well. It's, uh, you don't know what level to set. People's rights can still be violated because they're still being polluted. Uh, I'll give you one little story. Uh, in Ohio, there was this famous incident in the 1960s where the Cuyahoga River that goes through Cleveland caught on fire. Well, it turned out because of all the pollution. It turned out that wasn't the first time. The first time was in the early 1950s. Something interesting happened in the late 1940s. The Ohio common law was moving to allow people on the river to sue people upriver who polluted. And it was working. People were actually stopping to pollute, uh, and, and you know, it, was, it was working. The legislature got together in 1948 and overturned that and said, we want to give people, we want to d give permits to pollute and we'll decide who gets the permit. So they chose, what are the industrial rivers? In other words, what are the sinks, you know, for the pollution? And we'll, let, we'll give people liberal permits to, uh, to pollute there. And that's what led to it. So, so what didn't get tried very much, but to the extent it did get tried was starting to work, was property rights. And that's my first preference, would be property rights. Milton Friedman did say once that the, the least bad tax is a tax on, on site values. Not, not improvements on land, because then that will discourage improvements, but the site value of the land. And he's right, that is the least bad tax. Uh, Right, I know, I know, yeah, and he, Henry George, yeah, not allowed, yeah, right. Lloyd George taxed everything. Um, so, um, so yeah, there is a point to that. Now, here's the thing. In my ideal society, I actually think we might need taxes, and I'm, I don't like that, because I do think taxation is theft, but I think we might need a certain amount of theft, and I hate to say it that way. Uh, but 
I think we need taxes to be, for every level of government, a total of under 3% of GNP. And so if they're under 3% of GNP, you really have to mess up badly to have really damaging taxes. They aren't going to be, if, if it's on income, if it's on property, if it's a sales tax, matters. But what matters more is the level. And that's, I just, I want it to be a lot lower. So take any tax that exists today, and I think it's too high. Well, that's bad too. He's been waiting a long time. This, uh, well, I got oh, it first. Oh, okay. <laughs> David, on 9-11, uh, the World Trade Center, uh, notably one of the uh, symbols of capitalism in the world, was attacked. What can capitalists do to strike back? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I want to point out it was a government building. It was built by a government, the Port Authority of New York, because Rockefeller wanted to unload some land, and he found a government agency willing to buy it. So that's just an important part of history there. Uh, right. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. What's his name? Leased it, but it was uh, Silverberg, I think. Leased it. Okay. What can they do to strike back? Strike back whom? I, I got to get clarity. Just strike. First of all, 19 people are covered, right? 19 people who murdered are taken care of. So then the question is, who else is there who's involved in it? And, and I think that's something we should find out. Now, what are the best ways to do that? There is this part of the Constitution called letters of mark and reprisal. It is, it's something when you talk to an informed audience and they know more than you do about a lot of these things. <laughs> so I can just kind of mouth them and you'll get the words exactly right. And, and it is very clever. Jefferson used it, I guess, to go after some pirates. And the idea is to give private people incentives to go after the bad guys. And, and now, it is going to be hard to know who are the bad guys. But I can tell you who aren't the bad guys. It's the, year and a, the one and a half year old who got killed the other day when the, uh, when the roof in her house collapsed in Afghanistan. It's a whole lot of people who lost their families. Those aren't the bad guys. And so I think it, you have to go after the bad guys. I don't think you throw out all the rules and just say, they killed a whole bunch of our innocent people, therefore we should kill a whole bunch of their innocent people. Uh, he's been waiting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you. When you bring up these issues, you 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 think about uh, history, politics, economics, debates going back to Hamilton and Jefferson. So, um, Jefferson bought the uh, when Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase. Yeah, the Federalists were violently opposed. Um, they used tax money to pay for it. So, what if you were? Uh, at, on the Council of Economic Advisors, then what would you have said, Dr. Henderson? <laughs> uh, uh, don't. See, the thing is, one of the things that protects us, and actually, here's where the invisible hand works, and I want to go back to something you said that I wanted to amplify, that this man in front said, that one of the things that protects us is competition among governments. The more the, the more competition you have on, on, um, among governments, the less they can tax us, the less they can regulate us. So I believe in having as little government as possible at the federal level and have it down as low as possible. So I would have rather have seen, frankly, uh, the 13 colonies, and they, and, and they were, by the way, they had their 13 governments, the 13 states had their 13 governments, and not a strong federal government, and I was, Jefferson and I were together on that one. And then Louisiana Purchase just not have it and, and have some other government or some, some other political affiliation. I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago, as I said, I'm from Canada, laying out why most Canadians would be better off if Quebec were allowed to secede. And I think that's right, you'd have more competition. And I think, I think we would not have America throwing its weight around in the world the way it is if there weren't an America. In other words, if there were, say, 10 governments instead of one, or five, or three, or 50. And, and I think that would be preferable. And by the way, for that reason, I'm not in favor of what's going on in the European Union. I think that we're going to get this massive government over there. Yeah. Uh, 
just like to uh, comment on a, what a pilot told me the other day. I was asking about security in the uh, airplanes, and he was suggesting that September 11 could not have happened except for the fact that we didn't give our pilots freedom. Instead, we gave them a policy that said, if you ever have a hijacker, you have to go along with whatever he says. Yeah. And he said the simple fact of changing that policy will make all the difference in the world, much more than all the billions we're spending on extra security. Yeah. So sometimes ideas of freedom actually give us more security. Yeah, and I want to just amplify on that. And um, one of the, my big heroes, and I talk about a bit, a bit in my book, is Friedrich Hayek. And I had an article in the Wall Street Journal in October when the Nobel Prizes were awarded because they were all given to people who worked on information. And I point out, although you could argue that two out of the three of them deserve the Nobel Prize, they, they did work on asymmetric information, but I think they missed the most important asymmetry. It, it, and the most important asymmetry information is between decentralized information held by participants in the market and centralized information held by government. Look back at September 11th and think about the one thing that went right on that horrible day. It was Flight 93. It was people with their cell phones responding in a decentralized way to decentralized information. They knew what would happen if they didn't take over the plane. And that changed, that, as you said, that changed it all. That, cha that suddenly the stakes were different. And so if, we, if the government had done nothing on airport security after September 11th, we would have been safer than we were than, than, than before. Now, in fact, they could have even gone further, and that is deregulated. Let that be an issue for the airlines to choose. Do they allow pilots to carry guns or not? There was a hijack, attempted hijacking in the 1950s that a pilot, a, a pilot shot the hijacker dead in the, in the United States and ended the hijacking. So, so those, those are options. And uh, now, I don't think that, I'm not saying the federal government should require that airlines let their pilot have their pilots carry guns. I say airlines have strong incentives to make good decisions about that. Let them choose, and there'll be different choices. I want to point out one other thing. I was watching C-SPAN the other day, and it's unbiased. Uh, 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 they, uh, one, one senator was saying, we've got to have uniform standards at airports for security. I thought, does this guy ever play poker? <laughs> uniform standards, which means once you figure them out, you know how to do it anywhere. What you want is changing standards that aren't predictable. And that's what we would get with private airports, with private airlines, and so on. Okay, last question. Oh, wow. You sort of danced around this and... I didn't plan to. <laughs> no. One of the things you talked about was the ability to travel. The other day I heard a statistic, I don't know if it's accurate, that less than 5% of the population in this country has a passport. And one of the things that has profoundly affected me in my life is the ability to travel. And I think you're right about our oceans and the size of our country. And you go to Europe and you forget for what us is a state, is a country. Yeah. And you're constantly crossing through borders, and it's a totally different sense of government. And I also had the fortune of being in Germany when East Germany still existed. And I saw that border, and that has ultimately very much affected my thoughts on government and what I do. And then taking this back to the fact that people in this country haven't had a lot of exposure, and you have a very, in my mind, sanitized and liberalized media, how does capitalism come into effect in terms of educating people more? You don't see, I mean, you don't see capitalistic news, you know, happening. And I guess last... Capitalistic what? Well, you don't see, uh, you don't see a station yet that has been really um, in it, being pro, uh, okay, yeah, you know, okay. libertarian yeah, or capitalism. Yeah. You don't see these coming up. Yeah. And I guess my last comment in terms of yours on the Louisiana Purchase is, and having more governments, is do you ever think that there'll be a viable third party in this country. Okay. Um, I think that it's, it does help clearly to have competition in the media, but the major competition is not Fox, as I heard a few people saying. The major competition is the internet. Most of my information now, I, don't, I haven't watched the, the network news in a few decades. As, as a I mean, I watch it once in a while, but I used to watch it regularly. I, don't, I haven't watched it regularly in a few decades. 
And most of my information now I get off the web. I, I find out what they're saying in London newspapers. I read something on the Times of India this morning. All these things, and it's wonderful. And I, you really, and by the way, I highly recommend that you read what people in other countries are writing about us. It's very eye-opening. Um, I have a chapter in this book, again, I didn't talk about it. It's on education, in which I lay out the problems with government schooling, so-called public schools. And I think the, the major reform that could make all the difference in the world would be to get the government out of schools. And I lay out kind of the Prussian, <laughs> I, I lay out the Prussian roots of our government schooling, how it was actually intended to propagandize, and it's succeeding. And, and it was intended to make it hard to read, and it's succeeding. And I actually tell that story in there. And so, so I think that would be the major change, and I have some hope about that. Homeschooling is growing, and uh, you know I have some hope. Now, your last thing about uh, third party, uh, I don't know. See, what's happened is that the two major parties have carefully colluded using campaign finance laws to do what monopolists do, or duopolists do, and that is to try to rig the rules against outsiders. And so it's very hard now to compete as a third party. And uh, I don't, I just don't know whether, whether third parties w will, will be viable. But by the way, they could, it's, the good news is, they would not ever have to be viable in the sense of winning elections to be effective. And I want to tell a story that my friend Joe Furig in the audience told recently in a speech that I knew part of and I didn't know the last part of. A man named Norman Thomas ran for president starting, I think, in around 1928. And uh, in 1932, he ran, and Roosevelt won against Hoover. Roosevelt's platform called for diminishing the size of government, cutting taxes, cutting government spending, cutting government employment. He broke all his promises. A book came out in 1936 laying out a platform and saying, look at all these things this platform calls for, and look at all the things Roosevelt did. And Roosevelt had done what the platform called for. He said one little problem, the platform was Norman Thomas' Socialist Party platform. Roosevelt had implemented it. Well, Norman Thomas ran again and again and again, never won a state, never won a huge percent of the vote. But in 1956, he decided not to run. That was when Stevenson was, uh, yeah, Stevenson and Eisenhower run, were running. Eisenhower was running for his second term. He decided not to run, and the media who liked him because he was a colorful character to follow asked him why. And he said, well, the Republican Party has accepted everything I ran on in 1928. <laughs> so see, the way you can have an impact as a third party is by doing what, what you should do. I mean, take the positions you should take and let the other parties follow. So, for example, on the drug war, call for the end of the drug war, and then the other parties will move around the edges towards that position. That's what Ralph Nader did with the Green Party, to some extent talked about the end of the drug war, and, or at least diminishing it, and Harry Brown called for the outright end of the drug war for the Libertarian Party and said that if he were elected, he would pardon every nonviolent drug criminal in prison, which would have, by the way, solved our prison problem. <laughs> I want to thank David for uh, his talk, and if you join with me in thanking him. For <laughs> it's not just that, that this is really a great book, but David is a very good writer. So if you enjoy a good read and you can learn a lot from it, I highly recommend it again. Um, for those of you who have not gotten copies, there are copies upstairs still, and I'm sure he'd be happy to autograph them for you. Uh, thank you all for coming and making this a very successful evening for us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Independent Institute event. Good night.